you have to pay attention to detail and you have to give it your maximum effort. Welcome to the only easy day was yesterday, the official Navy SEAL podcast. Mental and physical health is essential to a successful trip through Navy boot camp, even more so for NSW candidates. I'm Daniel Fletcher. As we continue our boot camp series from Great Lakes, Illinois, we sit down with medical liaison for crew training command, Chief Hospital Corpsman, Jeff Ramirez. We answer some common questions about recruit medical history, mental health, medications, and preventative care. Listen up. Thanks for sitting down with us, for one. And if you could just briefly talk about what you do here, that'd be a great start. So I deal with all medical related issues in terms of recruit appointments, any injuries that we have here going to network hospitals, to the federal health care center, outsourced down to Chicago, any questionable areas that the doctors have that they need to liaison with the RDCs here um, mm -hmm. in terms of missed appointments or recruits not eating enough, or even if they feel like they're getting too much exercise. Because uh, okay. there's instances where we start breaking some recruits down that right. are couch potatoes and then they, they get over here. And right, right. That I learned right away that it's a, it's a little bit different here. What types of tests or any type of uh, screening do you administer? Or is that not part of your position? So that's not part of my position here. So uh, I deal with the docs and it's going to range from mental health mm -hmm. to your uh, physical therapy, uh, your preventive meds, um, and then general sick call. Um, but it's every, every illness or injury or anything medical related between RTC and the providers. Okay. Are there any ailments or injuries that you see specifically for the 800 guys that are coming through the pipeline here? 800 guys, I would say the biggest injuries that I see would be shin splints, stress fractures, and not getting enough nutrients. Really? Uh, rhabdo, rhabdomyolysis. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll see that. They didn't train for the pipeline before they got here. Okay. And so when they're doing the Dymo PT, their body's breaking it down. Pretty the severe. The muscles are breaking down pretty, pretty severe, yes. I guess that's a kind of form of a failed test, so to speak, if someone's um, put in a position physically where their body's not holding up. Are there any other specific medical tests that are given periodically or on a routine basis that you see NSW candidates having issues with? Special physicals. Mm -hmm. They'll go to special uh, physicals, they'll answer the questionnaires there, go through the, uh, their, their overall history, um, see if there's anything that uh, raises any red flags. In terms of Anything periodic that it doesn't happen unless they they choose to go to sick call. You know, if they are having some issues with RDCs, they, they see uh, any 800, any recruit really walking around with limps right. or uh, looking distressed or sick, we're going to send them to sick call regardless. Um, you get your labs drawn over there, or if you got to go to bone density scan or X-rays. Mm -hmm. A lot of 800s, you know, they really want to be here most of them, right, right, so it's right. kind of hard to get them to go to medical sometimes. So yeah. it's you know it's it's our responsibility, and I get a lot of phone calls that like about that, that I have a recruit that's kind of been limping around. He says he's okay, but yeah, however, right. those body senses tell him he probably needs to get seen, then we'll go ahead and send him in there and usually find out something, something else. If there's somebody who gets to this point in the process and then a medical screening turns up not, not good enough or, or a fail, whatever you want to call it, are there chances for a candidate to kind of retake a test? Can you tell me a little bit about that landscape of, the, of that kind of yes, situation? Yes, um, so if we're going to use vision for an example. so. If you came here and your MEP says, you know, the MEPS doctor says your vision's a certain score and you mm -hmm. come here and it's not or you're colorblind, they're going to reissue the actual test again. Um, so you're going to do one at MEPS, you can do one here. If you fail that, you're going to do it again. And if, you know, if all the uh, scores end up that's the same here, then they're going to either request a waiver if you're eligible. Um, the special phys docs, will, mm -hmm. they're going to determine who's uh, waverable per the BUMED instruction. So they'll, they'll go in there and make sure it is a waverable condition, whether it's vision, hearing. If it is waverable, we'll keep them in the pipeline here. And then uh, the waivers usually come back by the time they, they get out of here. If it's not, since they are, most of them are contracted, then they can opt to either pick a different rate mm -hmm. or pretty much get separated okay. um, in their contract. So your basic recruits... They're coming in, they're not contracted like the 800s. If they don't meet sp specific requirements for a certain job, then they'll get put in an, another job. But for the 800s, if they don't want to fulfill their contract because they can't um, due to something medically related, then they can either opt to, to go or, or stay with another, right. with another rate. 
our primary audience is, I guess I could say the layman or, or layperson or civilian. So I'm, I'll do a little bit of interpreting for mm -hmm. them. So someone who comes into the special warfare pipeline mm -hmm. is kind of quasi hired by the Navy and they can then choose to choose a different direction to take their career. Is that, is that is Yes, that that's exactly, okay. exactly what I'm saying. And if they don't, if they got their heart set on being a SEAL and you don't meet the medical qualifications to fulfill that contract, mm -hmm. then yes, you can drop on request and get separated from right, the Navy right. altogether. Or decide to, to, mm -hmm. to make a different decision. How often do you see that misalignment of MEPS decision versus something on site here? There's those that do fall, fall through the cracks. There's always human error. It's not as much as we think. Uh, most of our, our, uh, our drops are usually drop, drop on request, really, um, after dive mo. In terms of medical, um, it's not as much as we, what, what we actually think. Okay, well that's um, good to hear. Mm -hmm. What types of tests can a recruit fail to have them say, you're not gonna be able to be in the Navy at all? Hearing's a bigger, on a bigger scale right now than vision is. Why is that? Any kind of permanent hearing loss, the deeper decibels, it's an automatic disqualifier and some of them are not even waverable. So you're saying that it's starting to become a bigger issue than it used mm -hmm. to be, or, or it's more noticeable? Or? I think it's probably more, more noticeable. All the loud um, music. I think it, I would say that the earbuds and the working out, I mean, I'd, I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't say I'd do right, it myself. Right, right. Uh, I would imagine that has something to do with it. So if you listen to something loud right away, you'll have that, the, the minimum hearing loss, the temporary, at the lower, lower frequencies. Mm -hmm. um, but the higher frequencies, and uh, that would be you consecutively listen to your earphones really loud while you're in the gym 24-7. Yeah, or no in your good. cars nowadays. No good. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that there's sometimes injuries that happen during basic training that can kind of put someone in that same situation. Is that something that people should be concerned with or is that pretty rare in terms of shin splints that are so severe or whatever it may be that they're not able to continue? Do they have a chance to maybe have a few weeks to kind of heal up? So we have the recruit convalescent unit that is actually here in ship four. Mm -hmm. um, the, the reason for that is if you do get shin splints or stress fractures, you actually get a rehab time. So when you go to the, you go to the hospital, you go see one of our docs and they say, hey, you got shin splints, you're going to be light limited duty for 21 days. So that's 21 days of rehab. So during that 21 days, um, they're going to go to ship four and their job is to get better. They'll be put in a hold status until they are fit for full duty. And once they're fit for full duty, they'll incorporate with another, uh, another 800 to keep the training going. Does that happen often enough that you think that's a successful way to deal with that? Uh, I don't think it happens as, uh, as much for the 800s. Uh, for the regular recruit divisions, yes. Uh, for the 800s, no. And that's the same uh, process for both of them in terms yes. of the time that they're given? And stuff yes. Like that? If you look at the recruit convalescent unit, you'll have for every 30, 40 recruits, you might have one 800 in there. Um, usually the, when the 800s get injured is because that individual didn't prep. Right, right. So he came over here and did a little more running than what he or she was doing at the right, time. Right, right, right. From your perspective, what type of advice would you give to someone coming into the pipeline to avoid types of medical issues that we're speaking of? Uh, the biggest thing is prep. So don't do the, the bare minimum before you actually get here. You know, going over to Dymo PT, they're, they're going to give you a workout. Right. You know, so if you weren't prepped before you, you got over here, it's, it's going to show. And it's going to show quick. Dymo is real, really where they start uh, falling out. It's not regular PT. It's not the PT that all the other recruits right, get right. here because you're, you're contracted. You're going right. to do something more, more strenuous. Right. So it's definitely prep is, is, is huge. Is there part of the process that you think people should be maybe more aware of? You have to prep. The, the prep's the, the biggest thing. If you're taking a lot of protein powders and all this stuff you can get from GNC or bodybuilding.com, whatever you're taking, just right. remember you're not going to have it here. Okay. That's you know, that's the stuff that, that gets you over a good workout because sometimes you're pushing your body so much that you need that extra protein or you need a little bit extra. Or whether it's pre workout or pre workout, you're not going to have it here. Um, that's that's going to be cut straight out of your, your whole diet. Now you need to know how to eat correctly. And we do our, our classes here and teach you how to eat. However, it's a lot better if you have the history of doing it and you know your greens, you know your fruits, you right. know what you're doing. Because you can't just take that simple protein powder and, and call it a day. It's not going to happen. Right. If there's anything that you see on a common basis that you think that people should be more aware of, it would be great for you to kind of cover some of that as well. One big thing is the psych issue. And when, when I say that would be more geared towards the mental health part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, mental health is a big part here and they, it's a great, great tool for Recruit Training Command. Some of these, the 800 guys that we have, will get them and they are watching videos and everything since they were young. They're real motivated, can't wait to do it, which is outstanding. However, they come to boot camp and they figure out maybe this is not what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So there's a general hype that they, they get themselves going through for however long that they get themselves hyped up right, for. Right. But they get here and they kind of shut down a little bit. And once they shut down, it's kind of hard to pick them back up. So then they end up going to mental health and you know, talking to them. Sometimes they can say things that 
may dis disqualify him. Does it happen? Yes. And it's not, you know, on a huge scale, but however, it does happen. Uh, almost like they pretty much psych themselves out. Mm -hmm. The first couple of dive mode days, they kind of psych themselves out and they're like, okay, maybe this is not what I want to do because it's strenuous. It hurts. Right. But at right. the end of the day, it's this is what you wanted. And yeah, they're, they're, you're they're getting trained by the best people we have over there. Right. Um, but sometimes they can they can psych themselves out and they put themselves in a bad position. I think you brought up a good point. So much focus on the prep and even further along in the buds process and mm -hmm. then throughout. There's a huge emphasis on physical preparedness, um, physical capabilities, mm -hmm. but the mental aspects seem to be coming to the forefront a lot more than it used to be in the past. Yes. And even awareness of mental health issues. Speak to that a little bit. Are, are there underlying issues that people should be aware of if they want to come through basic training or maybe in the past um, they had issues with depression or mm -hmm. anxiety? What's the Navy's kind of opinion on that in NSW and the big Navy? And how does that kind of fit into your job? I work with mental health really, really closely here. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason being is because it is a different kind of day and age. Um, we, we have kids getting prescribed meds from our, from early age. Mm -hmm. However, that's not all disqualifying factors. Okay. Yes, there are certain diagnoses where it's gonna be a disqualifying factor and that's just kind of what it is. If you um, bipolar type two or something like that, it's, it's gonna be a disqualifying factor. However, if you struggle a little bit through school or even your first year of college, and you've shown progression and you, you have those notes by a doc saying that you're good to go, you've been on meds for a little bit or something bad happened in the family. These mm -hmm. are all things that they are waverable. Okay. Um, you just gotta show the actual documentation. So in terms of someone prepping to come here, it's good to know that if you're gonna get your civilian medical records and it's gonna say that you were put on a, uh, a certain medication, don't just stop. Right. Don't just stop and say, okay, well, I'm going to stop taking this because I plan to go to boot camp in a year. So if you stop when your doctor tells you to stop and then you show the progression for the, the, the one or two years, uh, preferably two, you know, the doc can sign off on that and say, hey, this, this person fell into a uh, kind of a slump, did what he had to do, uh, she had to do, and uh, recovered fully. We're good. Where we have the issue is when someone gets, um, goes to a hard part in their life, gets uh, prescribed some medications, and then decides this is what they want to do. They want to go to boot camp and then just stops it. So when you get some uh, civilian medical records, it shows that you were getting treated and then there's a blank. Right. So there's really nothing to go off of and now you gotta get reevaluated here. And it's a liability issue, right? It's huge, it's huge. So there's nothing wrong with mental health. It's, it's, it's a part of all of us, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. However, it's the way we go about it. Well, I think that's a, that's a good thing to point out. I think a lot of people might say, you know, whatever it is, existing condition, whether it's physical, mm -hmm. uh, mental or whatever, disqualifies me. I think reading between the lines is talk to your doctor and you guys want to see as long of a spread between whether it's a prescription or um, a diagnosis mm -hmm. and having some evidence to say like, hey, you know, this is where I am now. Mm -hmm. I think that it would be um, helpful for a lot of people to hear because a lot of people might just say, well, I can't, oh, do, I can't do that now. And uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, in mental health, there's, just, there's a lot of different areas, a lot mm -hmm. of different diagnoses, and this doesn't speak for every single one of them. But there's, there's a big chunk out there that's, you can still be in the Navy. Not, nothing wrong with it. You yeah. know, they just need to see the full treatment plan. Right. They can't just cut it off in the middle because you never, you never went through treatment then. There seems to be maybe some confusion in um, the aspect of medical records and how that's integrated into the Navy from civilian into the, integrating into the sailor life. What's that process look like? Or does the Navy get all, does they scoop up everyone's medical records when you come in? Well, any, any diagnosis, anything that you, you know, legally that you have to put on your medical history form. And it, that's a medical history form that's legally used by the whole uh, Department of Defense. You, you do have to provide that documentation if you put a diagnosis on there. So if you put a diagnosis on there, you have to provide that, that actual information because the doc's gonna know what the treatment plan was for and how that's gonna affect you. Um, in terms of receiving all the civilian medical records, we'll, we'll get what you put in there. Um, do we get them all? Probably not. Um, with that being said, we probably don't get it because they still got the, the human error or you got humans lying as well. Right, so you, if you they see don't that as list, an issue normally? Or, or I guess not normally, but. I think it is an issue. Okay. Um, otherwise we wouldn't have um, recruits separating every day because mm -hmm. they'll, they'll go to mental health or they'll get seen because past injury is gonna act up. Past injury acts up here and we find out that it's something that, that was pre-existing. Right. So now if they wanna stay in, we're gonna request those civilian medical records so we can see if you can actually stay in. But in terms of the Navy just reaching out to civilian hospitals and getting medical records, that's, 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 not, how that's not even legal. Well, obviously, it, it seems like being honest on your on your forms is probably not Huge. only legal, but the better thing to do for yes. your own success. Yes, absolutely. So, like I said, any medical history form you get in the Navy, you have to list legally. That's why they're asking you. We got to know what's wrong with you. And uh, if you don't provide that that actual information, you, you can get in trouble for that. 
But in terms of if you don't provide it, and even if we think something, it's not like we could reach out to where you got seen as a kid and say, hey, I need those records. It doesn't, doesn't, definitely doesn't work like that. Are there any kind of um, medical issues that can develop here that can disqualify someone completely from the Navy? Reoccurring stress fractures or re reoccurring shin splints. You're contracted to be here, however, you can't get past dive mode because you just keep on breaking, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And that's not mm -hmm. your fault. Right. However, that's, that's something that would definitely, you want to make it much farther than that because you're pretty fragile. And you're, after this pipeline, you're going on something even more, more right, aggressive. Right, more rigorous. We appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with us. I, I know um, this might not be the most glamorous topic, but it's, mm -hmm. it's just as important as every other part of this pipeline. You know, crawl, walk, run, medical is a big part of that. Thank you for your service and thank you for the time today. No, oh, absolutely. Find out more at sealswick.com and join us again for the next NSW podcast. Heads off, eyes open. Ah!